Welcome to the Fit Money Podcast, where we'll discuss something we all need through our entire life, financial literacy, but also asking the tough question, why aren't students learning it? Financial literacy is more than the math and a behavior we'll need beyond the classroom. So we're learning how we can help students, families, and teachers build a new generation of financially fit students everywhere. On today's episode, Fit Money Executive Director Jessica Pelletier talks to financial planner, author, and mother of four, Jamie Bossy, on her work helping clients improve their financial health and her original books to introduce healthy financial behaviors to kids. Together, they discuss why talking about money can be so difficult, how knowing money is actually more behavioral, and the questions parents have about teaching their own kids about money. Hi, Jamie. So great to talk to you today. Hi, Jessica. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, I wanted to chat with you today because we have a very shared interest in financial literacy, not just as something that adults need, which I know you do in your kind of day job, but uh, as as moms who really want to get this into the hands of younger audiences. So before we talk about that and how we're reaching kids, I'd love to hear more about what your job is and how you got into the career you're in. Yeah, so I have been in the financial planning industry for about 18 years now, and I actually majored in financial planning in college, If um, and that's, not, that's more popular now, but it wasn't super popular back then. Um, but I actually got into the field because when I was a sophomore in college, my parents filed for bankruptcy, and that kind of started a, a tailspin for me of questions of, you know, how did this happen? What does this mean? Um, and I really had gotten the sense at that point that I probably didn't have a good financial education myself. So I decided to take some, you know, personal finance 101 courses, Mm -hmm. uh, not with the intent of majoring in it, but with the intent of learning more for myself. That's great. I mean, sorry for that experience, but what a learning, a a very experiential learning uh, uh, opportunity for you and your family. Um, When you look back, having now been in the career that you are in advising clients on, you know, ways to obviously avoid bankruptcy, but also set up uh, systems to enhance their wealth. What do you think are some common mistakes? And perhaps what do you think happened to your parents? Yeah, well, I think in in general, my parents, you know, I'd, I'd like to say it was some sort of out of the ordinary circumstance, like a strange you know, expensive health issue or a business deal gone south or something more out of their control. Uh, But the truth was it really was just um, getting caught up in a a dangerous cycle with credit cards Mm -hmm. where, you know, you just do little charges here and there and then it kind of gets carried away and um, then the interest starts to build up and the payments get harder to make. Right. Uh, And we do see that as a pretty common issue. you know, with just Americans in general, mm-hmm. where, um, you know, once you start using the credit card or, or other debt as a band aid, you know, that impacts your future cash flow. And then that messes things up for you, you know, for months to come. I think the notion that, you know, and I don't really know how long ago this was, but that, you know, people would get their paycheck and kind of take it out in cash, you know, maybe put some of it in the bank, but then they'd have tangible physical cash they could touch and see. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe perhaps ran a budget that way um, because you can easily see when it's depleting, but the kind of advent of credit cards and now even payment apps that really make money just very intangible. You just really can't see it and touch it anymore. And especially for the younger generation, I think they can really get trapped. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like for you know kids today, money is getting so much much trickier to talk about because mm-hmm. yeah, like when we were kids, we had cash in our pockets or we didn't. Mm-hmm. And that determined if we could <laughs> buy something that day. Or like you said, if you had an envelope full of cash for groceries mm-hmm. and you were at the register and you didn't have enough to pay, then you had to put something back. Mm-hmm. Um, but kids today, you know, all they see is, you know, mom and dad punching buttons on their phone and, you know, b- Amazon packages magically appear mm-hmm. on the doorstep mm-hmm. or they slide cards. And, and I think the kids just really don't understand that an actual financial transaction is happening. Yeah, I think that experience really still needs to exist and we need to create ways 
for kids and, and even young adults to still have that experience of, you know, there is a limit to this mm-hmm. money. It does, you know, it is finite. Um, very few people that it's, that it's not. Um, yep. so, um, so that's really interesting. You know, I asked this of some people and I always am so curious to hear the answer. Why do you think money is so difficult to talk about? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I think because money is so wrapped in emotion mm-hmm. that it just, you know, cha- and emotions and behaviors and things that aren't really financial at all, right? So we can, you know, we know we're supposed to be saving X amount for retirement. We know we should have this much in our emergency mm-hmm. fund. You know, we know the numbers, we know the data, um, but we don't do those things. And, it, and it's fascinating to, you know, listen to psychologists and read books about it. But it really is that, you know, about 90% of this, the decisions we make are not rational. They're based on emotion um, and, and habits and behaviors. And those are all hard to change and control. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, that's a great answer. I, I completely agree. I think because we forget that so much about finance and even the courses that you took in college, personal finance, are behavioral in nature. I mean, yes, math helps. You have to learn how to add and subtract and, and do that. But <laughs> But the math lesson in financial literacy is really quite brief. And then it's really the behavior. And I think that's why what you uh, are doing and, and do, and this is why I really want to talk about your books, is so important. Because behavior is not something that I, you can learn when you're an adult. I mean, the, the adage, you know, the old dog, new tricks, and, <laughs> and I'm not calling you and I old, but, <laughs> but I think... People understand that if you don't, you know, if you don't train, if you don't practice, if you're not doing this over and over from a young age, you're not going to make, you're not going to have the behavioral choices to make those decisions. So talk to me a little bit about you decided, and and I I love your story. And so share it with, with folks listening. You decided to write a kid's book and I know now have two, but tell me about that thought process. Yeah, so I have four children um, of my own, and they're all under nine currently. Um, my first one, when he was five, we were shopping together at Target, and he had his eyes set on this, you know, sixty dollar immaculate grave digger monster <laughs> truck thing, and he was like, "Mom, mom, please can we buy this?" And I said, "Well, you know, that's not in our spending plan for today," and he said. We'll just buy it on Amazon then. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then my like just alarm bells started going off because, you know, I'm a financial planner by trade. And so I talk to people about money every day. And I I just was like, oh, no, I'm a failure. My kid (laughs) has no idea that how money works or what a financial transaction is. And so I, I started to research at that point, you know, what money concepts can kids understand at this age? Right. So he was five at the time. And I and I did some research and just figured out what basic concepts he could understand. And then I thought about kind of writing a poem for him Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about it. And so I do a lot of writing, or I have for a long time in terms of blog blog articles and things Mm -hmm. like that. Um, So I kind of set set down to write a poem and I wanted to use a fun character, which I used our family dog, Milton, Mm -hmm. and he's an adorable Corgi. And so I thought that would be a fun way to kind of communicate these concepts to my son. Um, and I ended up going from a poem into a book. And, and it's phenomenal. Um, and I know now you have two. Uh, and it, it is really great. I, you know, I've heard people say so many things. Kids are smarter than we think they are. You know, they all, you know, they're, they are mentally older than we think they are. And so we don't, I think, often talk to them about important things. And and I don't think it's necessarily appropriate to sit down and, you know, bring out your mortgage statement and your paycheck with your five-year-old. But it's so important that we do start those discussions. I'm sure you know, and, and we here at Fit Money really live by that research that financial behaviors and habits are really formed by age seven. Um, and that's frightening. You know, I've, I've right. equated it to, you know, taking driver's ed when you're 25 and you've already had your license for you know, <laughs> six or seven years. It doesn't really do you a lot of good. So I love that we, you know, uh, share that same goal to really talk to our younger kids. And I'm curious when you do your with your clients um, in financial planning, 
do any of them ask to kind of bring in their, you know, maybe not five-year-olds, but, you know, kind of younger kids to the discussion? Yeah, we uh, lately it has been a lot more interest in helping the kids get kind of a concept of finances and investing even. So we have several clients who have accounts for their high school age or college age kids where they allow them to choose a stock to invest in mm. um, and give them a certain amount of money each year to start it, trying out the investment market and seeing what happens so they can kind of get a feel for it. Um, and then a lot of clients are asking more about, you know, apps to use with their mm -hmm. kids and how allowance should work mm -hmm. and, you know, when they should get a debit card that mm -hmm. the kids can manage and those sort of questions. That's great. That makes me so happy to hear that more and more parents are recognizing the value of kind of a holistic whole family financial literacy approach. Mm -hmm. We all know, and I'm sure you're familiar with, there are several, you know, great uh, companies out there that do offer debit cards and, and uh, you know, um, prepaid kind of credit cards to younger and younger audiences these days. Mm -hmm. um, and again, going along with that experiential learning that we're talking about, um, but they really, I think, need to come along with some financial literacy because just the act of having a card doesn't all of a sudden make your behavior choices wise ones. You know, obviously if, if your son's card on that day, that $60 grave digger would have been in his pocket, <laughs> whether that was the right choice or not. Um, so that's really exciting that people are, are recognizing the value of, of teaching their kids and bringing them into the conversation. Yeah, because I feel like even if we're not actively doing it, they're still watching us. Right. So exactly. they know, like if we're stressed about money, they get the sense that, oh, money is stressful and bad. Right. Or, you know, if we are spending impulsively when they're with us, they see that. They know. <laughs> you shared a story. I think it was on LinkedIn, uh, which I know I commented on. And I've, I've, I've plagiarized a little bit because uh, I think it's so great um, about how you let your kids actually spend occasionally mm -hmm. um, because it's so important. Yes, I think the notion that we should always teach our kids to save. Um, I think we're all very, you know, everyone says, oh, yes, I have the piggy bank or we have the, you know, the, the savings account. And that is important. And that's one aspect of our relationship with money. But at the end of the day, we are consumers. We mm -hmm. will have to buy some type of shelter. We will have to buy some type of food. So we need to understand how to do that. And so you, um, you know, you, you, I shouldn't say let, but you let your child experience purchasing something and, and just tell me, tell me about that. It was so great to hear. Yeah. So we, um, we do allowance in our house for a different paid chores and the kids have their own give, save, spend jars that they put the money into. And we have them target, um, like at least a dime for every dollar that they earn goes into savings. Mm -hmm. And then they get to choose how much goes into the giving jar, if mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and when they have money accumulated in their spin jar, we do allow them to, you know, bring it with us. We'll take it with us to target and they can, you know, see how much things cost versus how much they have and decide how they want to spend those dollars. And I think the, the key part is, you know, we, we don't want to, you know, make them feel bad about spending money because, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, we do want to save, we do want to be smart with our money. Um, but we should enjoy it as well. Mm -hmm. So money, mm -hmm. you know, money can be a fun thing and, and something that adds value to our lives. Um, but what's been interesting to see is how the different kids kind of handle that scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, my older son now, he does do a lot more thinking about his purchase, right? So we'll go to Target, he'll, he'll like look at something for a while, really kind of investigate it. And he'll say, you know, mom, take a picture of this for me, would you? And mm -hmm. then, you know, then he'll like shop around a little bit more and see if that was, that's actually the thing he wants to spend his money on where my seven year old um, just wants to buy everything. And then he puts it all in the cart and then it's like, wait, I don't have this much money. <laughs> right, right. No, I think that's, it's so important. And I, that's so funny. Maybe it's a first child, second child syndrome. So mm -hmm. I've got two um, and my older son is, is so deliberate and so cerebral when it comes to, sometimes I actually say, I want you to, this is birthday money. I want you to actually use it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then my, my second is the same and buy everything. But what I, I love and I think I took from, from your story is, and I used this very recently, my uh, younger son got some birthday money and he very quickly bought something that I knew he was not going to really like. This was not something he wanted 
or had talked about, this was a, that real impulse. I have money in my pocket and we have to spend it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I went, went along with it, let him do it. And then, um, you know, about a week later, I, I asked him, I said, you know, I haven't seen that toy come back out. You know, we played with it once and kind of that it was excitement. And he said, yeah, mom, I, I think I regret buying that. It really, I should have thought more intently about that. I thought, oh my gosh, for a nine-year-old to yeah. say that mm -hmm. and to recognize that, I thought, wow, what a great, just what a great experience for him. I mean, it ended up being $15. It wasn't yeah. <laughs> life altering, um, but you know, it just proves to us that these little people really can understand these these life lessons. Yeah, yeah, and we do, and it's it, it kind of sounds backwards, but we kind of want them to make some silly mistakes now, like exactly. while they're young and while it doesn't really cost much, you know, to fix or they're not able to make their mortgage payment, you know, things right, like right, that. exactly. Well, they want them to make the mistakes while the stakes are low now, exactly, um, and that you can have a conversation about it and kind of, mm -hmm. you know, not make them feel bad for the mistake, but just um, have them kind of say it in their own words, what they would do differently next time. And that way they're really kind of solidifying that lesson in their own minds. Remind me the state that you guys are in and do you have any financial literacy in your schools? Uh, we're in Kansas okay. and uh, we don't have mandatory um, classes in our schools. We do have some great volunteer organizations that um, volunteers come and teach in the classroom and things, but, um, but yeah, I haven't heard much on what the state will be doing. Great. Well, the, the good news is it does seem to be a much more relevant topic um, for educators to be um, getting engaged in. And I think as people realize that it is a, and I think, and I think you agree, critical life skill um, there's not a person on the planet who doesn't have some type of relationship with money. Um, and, you know, I think we're doing a disservice by not teaching our kids. And so um, my state's the same. I'm in Massachusetts and we're trying to get them to, you know, get this in our schools and, and make this a graduation requirement as well. Um, and so uh, Fit Money tries very hard to bridge that gap uh, here and, and work with other states that, that, that does have um, that, uh, that requirement. Um, any yep. plans for another another book or, or what's next on the Milton front? Yes, I do have uh, two more Milton books in the works. Um, one just more of a, of a grateful gratitude kind of theme where we, you know, we spend money on things and it adds value to our lives, but also taking stock of what we already have that we are thankful for and that some things in life that bring us joy don't cost money at all. Right. Yeah. And then I um, hope to do one on once versus needs, more of that kind of concept mm -hmm. with Milton. Um, but right now I have the storylines written, but I want the books to rhyme. And so that always takes a little bit longer to get that all figured out. That, hey, good good for you. I know that kids really, you know, and it helps them learn to read and it really helps them remember it. So I, I can't wait to read it. Um we, uh, I know you mentioned something uh, in your jars on the giving jar, which mm -hmm. I think is also so important for kids to understand. And um, I think the notion of the lemonade stands, and I see more and more of those now being done in the name of charity, which I think is, mm -hmm. is really important. And um, I think that's another gift that we can really give to kids early is that, you know, they can understand the, the role that they can play, whether it's a lemonade stand that raises five dollars that they give to their local you know uh, community center or what i think that really shows them and allows them to see their place in in the world and and i i really appreciate that you discuss that as well yeah and i think just giving in general and and making that a habit to the causes that you care about um makes your money something special and something bigger than yourself and i think kids really can get behind that oh absolutely absolutely I really enjoyed chatting with you today, Jamie. Thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing with us more about Milton. I can't wait to read uh, your next two books. And uh, anything else you want to tell our audience about where you can find uh, and read more about Milton? Well, sure. So the books are available on Amazon. They're also available on MiltonTheMoneySavvyPup.com. Mm. And just recently, I posted some resources on that page as well that are downloadable worksheets and games that teachers can use or you can use with your kids in a group setting uh, for elementary age kids. Oh, fantastic. We'll definitely go there. Thanks so much, Jamie. Thank you. Have a great day. 
Thank you for joining us today on the Fit Money Podcast. Whether you're a caregiver, teacher, or student yourself, there's plenty of great K-12 resources to begin or continue your financial literacy journey at fitmoney.org. Visit the show notes for more from today's guest and financial literacy activities for the classroom, at home, or on the go. We'll see you next time. And until then, happy learning, earning, and saving. The Fit Money Podcast is presented by Fit Money, the leading K-12 financial literacy curriculum, providing free, unbiased financial literacy resources. All opinions, products, and references during the show are not endorsed by Fit Money and are solely opinions of the individual. Fit Money does not claim any responsibility for external resources referenced during the episode. All Fit Money products and episodes are provided for educational purposes and are not professional advice.